Okay, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is James Stevenson. I'm the Regional Sales Director for Demisto. Um, and we're going to be spending the next 30 minutes talking about a rapidly emerging market called SOAR, which is a, a new acronym that we all have to learn, uh, coined by, uh, by Gartner. So just to start off proceedings, uh, how many people have heard of the acronym SOAR? That's music to my ears. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, so me and uh, Leo, uh, we did an e-crime conference uh, last year and asked the same question, and maybe 5% put their hands up, and we did e-crime this year, and pretty much everyone put their hands up, like we've just seen. So you know, the, the message is getting out, which is absolutely brilliant. And what we're going to do is going to spend 30 minutes talking about what's actually driving that market and some of the challenges that SOC teams are facing today and how SOAR can actually you know, fill some of those uh, gaps that we're, um, that we're dealing with at the moment. Now, in terms of everyone that showed their hands, can I, can I have a show of hands again, please, if you don't mind? Show of hands. There's less hands now. They're a bit nervous about the next question. Okay, keep your hands in the air. Right. The next question is, who can tell me what it actually stands for? Ah, uh, there's Mo. Okay. Go on, Mo. Security, blah, blah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, so for everyone that didn't hear, that's uh, security orchestration, automation, and response. I've been talking about it for 18 months, and sometimes I still get it mixed up. So, um, okay, so uh, moving on. Um, so, go ahead. And, uh, we can give away the slides later. Yeah, absolutely. So, don't make any notes. Um, I'm going to send all the slides. We'll send you the slides. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, in terms of a bit of background about myself, uh, do not be afraid of my, my initial introduction where I said regional sales director. Uh, because I actually spent many years as a SOC analyst. And again, a couple of colleagues in my room, in the room have been listening to this for 18 months. They're like, yeah, okay. So I'm going to give you a bit of background about where I came from uh, and why I'm actually extremely passionate about this emerging SOAR market and how it can help. Um, and I'll go on to that in just a moment. Um, and in terms of my general interest, and again, happy to have a conversation after this, you know, any form of tool or methodology that's designed to improve your detection and response capability thereby closing that window of exposure, that's something that really excites me, I think, as an ex-SOC analyst. So, okay, SOAR is, is a part of that, but you know, anything that truly drives down that, that window of opportunity for the attacker, you know, I'd love to have a conversation about other tools and methodologies that assist in that process. Okay, so uh, statement number one. Um, this is a bit of an understatement, uh, but the, the SOC is experiencing some challenges. Um, and based on the conversations I've had today at, at our booth, um, I think a lot of people can relate to this. Uh, there's some smiling faces I can see as well. So whether you're, you've built an internal SOC or whether you're using a managed security service or you're using a hybrid, for example, using tier one for managed services and then obviously use, uh, do tier two, tier three, um, there's some massive challenges that have been around for 15 years that actually haven't improved. And I just want to cover those because that's what's driving the SOAR market. So I'm going to start off with this. Um, Five security analysts walk into a bar. Okay, I'm going to let you look at that picture for a moment. There's a few things wrong with it. Um, can anyone tell me what's wrong with that picture? And this really does set the scene with the challenges that we're about to go into. They're in the bar. They're in the bar, okay. They're smiling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, that's one of the answers. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> I need to modify this. They're all agreeing about something, yeah. They're all looking at different things. They haven't checked the beer. There's anything wrong My initial picture actually had three men. It was actually, I've got two daughters, and it was one of them that said there's no women in that picture. So I did change it. So, uh, but that's one thing. But I don't, there's no turbans, though, like you said. So I'm still, uh, I can't please everyone. Uh, but uh, <laughs> is, there, uh, is there anything else? You're drinking the same drink. Okay, right. So this really does set the scene, okay? How much time have I got? Have I got 30 minutes? Bad for you guys, but yeah, I've got 30 minutes, which is good. Okay, number one, analysts do not have time for beer, okay? Back when I was a SOC analyst in 2002 and I had no events and I was just sitting there watching Sky Sports, Sky Movies on my night shifts, I had time for beer. Um, but if you accelerate 15 years since plus, um, they do not have time for beer. And I think everyone can relate to the challenge of high alert volume, Okay, uh, show of hands of people that uh, can associate with that challenge of high alert volumes. Alert fatigue, oh. alert, fatigue alert volume, yeah. okay. Uh, and long investigation times. You know, it does take a long time to manually collect that data across siloed solutions. I think there was a, 
uh, a quiz earlier in terms of some challenges. I know that you know, having siloed solutions was, was up there. That doesn't help matters when you're trying to collect the data, enrich, and make an informed decision as an analyst. So these, these investigations take a long time. Um, analysts are not happy. Again, uh, five years in that environment, I can never remember a day where there were five of us looking like that. So there uh, must be something in the beer. Um, they are dealing with manual, repetitive tasks. And typically, 90% of their time is doing tier one triage, and, it, and it's not fun. Okay? That's one of the reasons I ended up rage quitting, uh, because I couldn't stand it anymore. Um, and they're overwhelmed and fatigued by that, that triage process. And also, finding five analysts in a room is a tad unlikely. So there's a massive skill shortage in the market that I'm sure we've all read about. So basically, if you are a SOC analyst in this room, that's great for you. You can go back and ask for a pay rise, okay? Because the challenge is re retaining you, okay? Um, again, when I was in the SOC, I spent five years having someone camped outside Royal Holloway getting brand new recruits uh, because they were eager to learn and, quite frankly, cheap at the time. Um, and then after about 18 months, they'd be trained, and then they would leave and go to a bank in Canary Wharf to do the same crap job but for more money. Um, so retaining employees or analysts is really, really difficult. Okay. Show of hands of people that have experienced that challenge, just out of interest. Skill shortage, trying to fill up the sock. Okay, so you've got the money but, and you've got the tools, but now you need the humans to look at it. Okay, interesting. Before I go to the next slide, well, actually I'm going to pass, there might be a can of worms. I'll leave it for the moment. Okay, so again, apologies for my, uh, my colleagues in the room. Um, so that's where I worked. So I spent five years in a decommissioned nuclear bunker. Uh, I graduated with life and irritating enthusiasm and then someone stuck me in there with no windows. Um, I lost all social skills, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here in front of all these people. Um, and uh, I don't know how I got married and ended up having kids, but you know, that's another matter. Um, so yeah, so it was during that time where I got a really good understanding of SOC operations uh, and some of the challenges that we're going to go into detail. And again, like I said, these challenges were back in 2002, 2007, okay? And <laughs> actually, by the way, for those that know Teletubbies, I don't know if you've got kids, that is basically, it's basically Teletubbies Hill, so we'd literally uh, park here, we'd work under here, um, and uh, what was very interesting was the weekends, because there's a lovely view of Winchester Cathedral, and couples used to park there and do what couples do. Uh, they had no idea, though, that we actually had, <laughs> well, we actually had, we had cameras here, here, there's a camera there, um, it was great entertainment, um, but uh, moving on. So moving on, that no one had any idea that we were under there. There were actually about eight analysts at the time in SOC engineers, um, in that, in that hill. So anyway, so anyway, going back to point, these are the key challenges driving the market at a high level. Okay, so we talked about too many alerts. So when we first set up the SOC, we had no SIM. So we literally had loads and loads of um, monitors looking at IDS, IPS, firewall logs, proxy logs, and we literally had a chair on wheels, literally rolling from about here to about there. I'd say this was a void to be used for you know actually shooting things and basketball. But anyway, there was um, ultimately a line of desks and we literally had to look at every single siloed solution to correlate incidents, okay? So those days we had to look at two incidents a minute. At the moment, most companies are dealing with five incidents a minute. So it's just showing the, the amount of noise that's being generated. We did deploy a SIM and the SIM was a godsend in terms of consolidating all those siloed solutions from a log perspective and giving me a unified view, but then we got overwhelmed in the triage process. We had too many correlated alerts coming up, and what that meant is inconsistent instant response. We had so much noise, the signal-to-noise ratio was so bad that we actually had really good quality alerts, but we were missing them because we had so much to deal with. Okay, show of hands of people that can, can associate with that challenge. You've, got, you've invested in good tools, you're getting good alerts, but you're just getting too many. Okay. So that's a real big issue. And I also talked about burnout. Um, so again, as I said, most of my analysts, when we trained them up, uh, they would leave within 18 months uh, because of that manual repetitive work they have to do. So my goal and my vision is to automate all the tier one work and free up their time to do proactive threat hunting, vulnerability research, all the things that a SOC analyst enjoys that will also retain them, but ultimately gives you uh, from a business perspective, um, it gives you a lot more return rather than just looking, spending 90% in a triage queue. Um, context as well. Um, I kind of talked about the challenge of enriching and collecting data, so I won't cover that again. But I think security silos is extremely important. Even with a SIM, even with all that correlation and it helps bubble things to the surface, when you're actually doing detailed 
investigation and then response, you still need to go into those to separate security tools like your EDR tool or your sandbox tool or your threat intelligence tool. And there's still a lot of segregation going on. Uh, and what SOAR is trying to do is kind of bring all that together, break down the silos, and then orchestrate the response across all of your investments. Okay? Any questions on that bunker slide? No? Okay. Okay, so this is actually, uh, again, from a, a white paper called The State of SOAR, uh, 2018, uh, but it, it's still relevant, is that in summary, I think we all get the picture now, too many incidents and tools. Now, these tools are actually all great, and they actually all provide some form of value. It's just we're being overwhelmed by the noise that's being generated. Um, and also, this is actually a response from about 500 um, respondees, uh, from SOC managers to CISOs. Uh, and the key things that stand out in terms of the challenges around instant response is quite clear. So 80% said, we don't have enough time. That's because they're doing everything manually. Um, they don't have enough people because of the skill shortage that we discussed. And people are poaching good SOC analysts. 70% um, res responding to a large number of incidents. Okay? And here's the one on the right here that I've underlined in green, just working with a large number of tools. So from a training perspective, that also is costly to get them to learn how to use that sandbox, that EDR solution, that threat intelligence platform, that firewall. So that causes problems as well. So really what I want to do is just reinforce the fact that uh, you know, these problems are real and uh, consistent. And also this problem is universal across all verticals and all companies. So I've had a couple of conversations today saying, you know, who could benefit from SOAR? You know, is it a large company? Is it a two-man SOC team? It's everyone. Um, you know, anyone that has this issue, which is most people, automation helps scale humans, essentially. Okay, so ultimately what I found over the past 18 months, and from Gartner's perspective over the past couple of years, is that these challenges that we've discussed is, is driving SOC transformation programs. And the ones that I've been involved in, uh, you know, specifically in terms of improving tooling and workflow and instant response within a SOC environment, um, and improving cyber resilience, I think this is something that we can all relate to and it's not rocket science, right? Number one, you know, prevent everything you can. The quick wins. You know, antivirus still provides, I know there's all the focus on, oh, only focus on signature-based detection. It's not very good at the unknown, true. But it's also very good at getting rid of the known threats, right? So it still plays an important role. Um, everything you can't automatically block, you need to rapidly investigate, okay? And that's where things like EDR comes into play, okay? That's a really good example, okay? So if you can't block it, find it quickly, again, to close that window of exposure, understand the root cause and that causality, and then once you understand that, you can then move into the response phase, you know, quarantining endpoints, adding IP blocks on firewalls, whatever. Um, and this is where automation plays a part. So SOAR is about automated incident response by building playbooks, okay? Um, and in terms of this market at the moment, so Gartner, again, released, I know we all have our views on Gartner, but it's one of many. Others are available. Um, but ultimately, uh, in 2017, they released a, a paper on, on this Gartner market. And they said by 2022, 30% of uh, all companies will leverage some form of SOAR tool, whether it's off the shelf, whether it's you know, homebrew, whether it's open source, for example. Uh, there's many out there. Um, what's very interesting here is the state of SOAR report that's just come out in 2019, it says we're actually already there. So at the moment, again, around 500, I think it was the same people from the 2018 report, pretty much, 28% of people are already using some kind of SOAR tool. Okay? So that's not to say, if you've already done it or you've not already done it, it's not to say you're behind the curve or you're ahead of the curve. My point here is it's, it's relevant. Everyone's talking about it. Every vendor's saying they have some form of automation and orchestration capability. And I just think that further revalidates the point that people need automation to scale. Because you can chuck more people at the problem, but it gets more expensive doing that. Uh, that was another challenge I had at the SOC, just the people costs associated with it. Um, and, and humans don't scale as well as you know, machine-powered learning, really. So, okay. How am I doing for time? Good. Thank you. Um, yeah, so essentially a SOAR solution will Let's take a step back. When you think of automation in any industry, right, whether it's security or car manufacturing, everyone here understands the gains of automating something, and the same applies to security. Okay? So it doesn't matter you know, whether you're using partial homebrew-based automation, like a good open source solution would be the Hive. Show of hands of people who heard of the Hive project. There's a few there. So some really good open source and off-the-shelf, commercial off-the-shelf technologies. 
Um, and again, I want to be obviously vendor neutral in this conversation so it benefits all, but they all try and solve the same problems, but just in different ways. So whether you go homebrew or go full automation, you're going to improve the efficiency of your SOC, okay? And, you, and it also enforces consistency, because when you have an automated playbook, like an instant response plan that you've digitized, you're forcing the analyst to go through a, a path on rails. They can't deviate, okay? Even if it's manual, you're still guiding them through that process, okay? So that consistency also reduces risk to the business. One of the biggest issues I had that I, as an analyst, would deal with a buffer overflow in a certain network segment, very different from a colleague of mine. And it was just because we had different perceptions, different ways of interpreting the alert, different experiences, and that causes problems, ultimately. So it's very important that a playbook, whether it's automated or manual, it does enforce consistency, and that helps the business. And again, just to reinforce my point, that increasing SOC efficiency for automation reduces uh, mean time to detection, uh, mean time to resolution and risk, more acronyms, is again the Gartner point at the bottom that just came out in 2019. Saw tools will significantly improve your instant response capability, okay, through machine powered assistance. Okay, so hopefully that sets the scene, and then what I did is I left the SOC and joined the dark side, sales, close brackets, okay, but with a good, you know, SOC background. But I just want to kind of set the scene there, okay, we do have cookies, they're actually outside, so there we go. Uh, so, uh, and what you're seeing here is uh, a couple of people that left the SOC. Uh, we did a number of startups, but one of the ones, our uh, most recent ventures, was Demisto. Okay? So the guy on the left, Andy Shepard, I think some of you have uh, met him before, uh, ex-SOC guy as well, rage quit like I did, uh, and both me and him joined Demisto at the same time. And our job was to build the Demisto business outside of the US for the UK, Benelux and Nordics. Um, so, you know, he hasn't lost any of his credibility because he still has engineer in his title. Uh, I don't, so I've definitely lost all credibility. Um, but again, Demisto was building automated playbooks to improve the efficiency of the SOC, okay? Automate those manual repetitive tasks that consume large amounts of our time, okay? And then uh, what, we, what happened, uh, we didn't expect it so soon. So in March uh, this year, we got acquired by Palo Alto Networks for 560 million. Again, the number's kind of irrelevant, but again, it just reinforces that this is a growing market. Palo Alto Networks saw an opportunity and acquired us. Uh, we were only running for two years, and in that time, we acquired about 350 customers. Um, and uh, it just shows the growth of this, okay? Anyway, marketing went to town. They spent months trying to come up with a new name, and they just came up with this. They just added that at the bottom. <laughs> so, um, well done, marketing. You've excelled yourselves. Uh, and I think this is important, actually, because saw products should be vendor agnostic. Okay, when someone like Palo Alto Networks buys something like Demisto, you know, my, you know, the fear was, oh my God, you, know, you are good because you work with a Fortinet or a Checkpoint or a FireEye or a Carbon Black or a Tanium. It, you know, because that's what a SOAR is about. It's about integrating with all of those tools and automating the response or orchestrating across all those tools irrelevant of the vendor. And I think for me personally, that's why you know, it's good that we're keeping the Demisto brand. Okay. Okay, so what is a SOAR tool? Okay, so at a high level, when you're looking at a SOAR tool, you think, do you know what, I understand these challenges, I have these challenges, or I can see these challenges in 18 months' time, what should a SOAR tool give you? Okay, so there's a few, three key elements. It should be a workflow automation engine, the ability to build like a Visio-style di diagram, drag and drop, build this playbook and automate it. Okay, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. It should be a, a case management system as well. Okay, again, this is from Gartner's... Um, recommendations of what a SOAR tool should do. Most SOCs are using something like ServiceNow or Jira or whatever, and they all say the same thing. ServiceNow is great for other parts of the business, but it doesn't help my SOC guys, because every time I want to change the workflow of ServiceNow, I've got to go to, or, or any other case management system, I typically have to use third-party professional services to change the workflow and the logic. So the beauty of a SOAR tool is not only does it provide automated playbooks, but it also gives you case management that the SOC team own control. Please. You, do you want to mute me? No, <laughs> sure. That is actually a question we get asked a lot. Yep. Is everyone gets so yep. in terms of response, but what they don't want to change is the existing VMC or Absolutely. service now or whatever. Yes. Because they feel rightly so, maybe, it's just another dashboard, another workflow that they have to work with. Yep. Sorry, this, is, this is really good. Um, no, this, this, this is excellent. And this, I think, in every project that I've been involved in 18 months, this comes up every time. 
every time. So most, most of them have uh, ServiceNow, okay? We even Palo Alto Networks, we use ServiceNow. But again, when the SOC is trying to manage these incidents, track the incidents, build dashboards and SLAs, there's a bottleneck waiting for them to change that logic and workflow. So a SOAR tool empowers the SOC team by giving them their own case management system, but it still integrates with something like ServiceNow. So if you have a ServiceNow investment and you buy a SOAR tool, that SOAR tool will ingest all the cases from ServiceNow, automate the response, whether it's phishing, vulnerability management, onboarding a new employee, setting up a, you know, a cloud-based environment, doing all the work within the platform, which the SOC controls, and then outputting back to the ServiceNow facility to close the case, for example. So the important thing here is that when you invest in a tool, like a SOAR tool, make sure it can work with your case management system. So I do appreciate that um, because I think that's a really good point. Okay, So two-way integration is, is really, really key. And then finally, collaboration. Playbooks will not help you end-to-end. -end, okay, it's, t it's very rare. A playbook, even though it's automated, will stop maybe halfway through and go, look, I've done all the enrichment for you, Mr. Analyst or Mrs. Analyst. Um, here's all the information to enable you to make an informed decision. Okay, um, and we're going to hand it over to you for manual inspection. So playbooks are typically used to do all the heavy lifting and the grunt work, um, but then you need to collaborate afterwards. That's why a saw tool typically has some kind of chat ops based feature where all the analysts log into a room, they look at all the information that's been presented by the automation tool, and then they can communicate and decide how to deal with the incident. So collaboration is important. So if you're looking at a saw tool, if it has those three components, you're on to a good start. Give an example actually, this is actually a customer, WestJet, okay, a Canadian airline, budget airline. And what they're showing is actually a video that they gave us of showing what they do when it comes to vulnerability management. They're looking at ServiceNow, okay? They're looking at their vulnerability management tool. And this is an analyst copying and pasting the fact that there's a new vulnerability, they're checking their asset databases, they're creating ServiceNow cases. There's a lot of, it gives you an idea of the amount of copying and pasting analysts typically do, okay? And this applies, sorry? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you get two cookies, that's awesome. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, I, to be honest, probably because he does this 90% of his time, he's got really, really efficient at it. Um, but uh, ultimately, this is... <laughs> absolutely, uh, it's probably Sheldon uh, from, from Big Bang. Uh, but ultimately, he's multitasking. But this just gives you a really good idea, no matter what the use case is, it gives you a really good idea of what an analyst does. Okay, whether it's phishing or vulnerability management. Okay, now this is just an idea of what a playbook looks like. Okay, this is what we're. Oh. I think did I actually hear someone say that? Because that was pretty good. Oh. <laughs> Music to my ears. This is the concept of a of a playbook in a SOAR platform. Okay, the ability to identify those big time sinks that take a long time, that's manual and repetitive, and the ability to essentially drag and drop and build these again, these Visio style workflows, and anything you see with an electric bolt is an automatic action. So you're actually seeing a playbook running live, essentially, okay? From quarantining endpoints to quarant adding IP block lists on firewalls to sending an email to the end user saying, did you click that phishing link that you just sent to my spam box? You know, uh, if it, you know just as an example, um, it really, really streamlines the response process. So let's go on to phishing. So anyone that's engaged with any SOAR vendor will go, you guys just keep going on about phishing. I want to see a playbook other than phishing. And it's true, you know, uh, you can build a playbook on anything. Um, my engineer actually built a playbook on his wedding, which we had a, a few weeks ago. Not we, I attended. Um, I wasn't part of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can build <laughs> anything that's manual, scriptable, and repeatable. You can build a playbook for it. Okay, so like when me and Andy joined Demisto, there was a playbook that ran in the background that gave us access to, you know, sent our mobile phone, gave us a laptop, enabled we use Okta, okay? Setting all that stuff up can be done via a playbook. When we do proof of concepts, my engineer doesn't spend an hour building the POC in, a, in an AWS cloud environment. He literally clicks play, runs a playbook, and it does 45 minutes of cloud configuration automatically. And the beautiful thing about an automatic playbook is there's no room for human error. Right? It's, again, ensuring that consistency. So let's look at phishing, because we all understand it, and it's a common use case. Imagine one of your employees receives a phishing email okay, that bypasses your security tools, ends up in their inbox. If you're a good corporate citizen, you're going to send that to the security team. I think this is malicious. Could you investigate? The security team will read that inbox, manually send an email back to the end user saying, please don't touch, we're investigating. They then look at the email, 
then extract the, the links and see if they're malicious links to drive-by exploit servers. If there's an attachment, they're going to manually extract the attachment, send it to a sandbox to see if it's bad, wait for those results. Um, if it is bad, they're going to then manually tell the user, it's bad, did you click on this link? Then they're going to go to their firewall and block that URL okay, on their proxy or their firewall. And now we have the hash of that malicious file, for example, if it was an attachment or if it was a, a dropper from obviously the drive-by exploit server, you're then going to go to all your EDR solutions and go, here's the hash, does this exist on the rest of our estate? Now, as you can imagine, on average, that is around a 45-minute investigation process. Okay? It could be 20 minutes, it could be 45 minutes, okay, but it's minutes. Now, what you're about to see now is the exact playbook and workflow automatically. quickest demo in the world, okay? I'll let you go back, and I'm going to walk you through it. How much time have I, how much time have I got, actually? Five minutes? Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Ten. Mm. Uh, so um, let, me, let me pause it just for a second. Eight more minutes. Eight more minutes. Okay, so just to give you an idea, okay, so playbook, phishing is a very common use case, but there's two parallel threads. On one side, when a sortal it receives the email that the end user sent. So they send the email to a, an inbox that, that the sortal is monitoring. Okay? There's two parallel threads. On one path, it's like, who sent me the email? Do an active directory lookup, say, oh, Jay Stevenson is James Stevenson, he works in I don't know, sales, for example, and then automatically send an email back to the user. James, please do not touch. Thank you for letting us know about this. We're investigating. And on the right-hand side, the playbook, there's actually a playbook within a playbook, sub-playbooks. Okay, so the ability to have a playbook that says extract the email, automatically extract the IPs, the domains, the links, the attachments. Okay, so you can see here where it says extract IP addresses from the email. So if I just click play, just let it do its thing. Let's see if I can pause it. And then there was, you've missed it, but there was actually a path where it says, is this IP bad, yes or no? Is the domain bad, yes or no? Is the file attachment bad? Yes or no? And if the answer was no, we would have actually gone down a completely different path and said, right, I now want you to sandbox that attachment, or I want you to take that URL and see what it's, it's, it's delivering from a web service. But because we confirmed that Netflix, it was actually a Netflix phishing email, uh, actually, that we use in live demos, but because the, the link was going to a drive-by exploit server and the threat intelligence provider we're using said it was bad, we went down the yes path. So then we automatically went to the response phase assign to an analyst, set the severity to high, um, send an email to say, it's bad, did you click it? And actually we wait for a reply, and if the answer is yes, we then automatically set up a, a Zoom meeting, for example, or, or whatever you can imagine. You know? So the user influences the playbook, and they don't even know the playbook is running. <laughs> automatically, again, think about the amount of time an analyst will spend collecting data, automatically take screenshots of the drive-by exploit server, automatically go to my security analytics solution or SIM solution, and we automatically run API calls to get all the logs, all the PCAP data, run TCP dump if we have to on the fly, and then attach it to the, the case management system that's baked in. And then, if you confirm it's bad, here's a hash, go to all my EDR agents, and automatically see if that's present anywhere else. Or even, we know that this malicious file will create this registry key. So it's going to find that registry key and automatically quarantine or fix. Okay? Is that me? Sorry. Okay, so I've got a couple of minutes left. I just want to give you a couple of top tips around SOAR, again, in terms of my experience and what I've learned so far. Okay? Now these are from very large, um, I think we're filming at the moment, so you know, very large you know, shipping companies to uh, companies that build um, platforms to predict market trends, where there's like two men security teams, okay? So what have we learned? Okay, uh, again, in my experience, <laughs> I'm probably gonna get sued. Uh, so, okay, I never looked like that, okay? But I did look like that by the time I quit, okay? Um, but I think the business will like the fact that you can measure the improvement in terms of instant response, because again, a sorter will track how long it takes to manage and you know, close an incident. So obviously you're going to reduce that window of exposure, okay? So that reduces associated costs and uh, that risk. Um, you have an audit. So as these playbooks run, it records all the output forever if you want to put enough storage to it. So you can go back, 
to an auditor and say, look, we've got playbooks for this eventuality. Here it is. Okay? And actually, every time we run the playbook, here was all the output. So if you need to do an after-action review, for whatever reason, like if there is a, a breach or something, the fact that you've got a system of record of that playbook running is uh, very valuable. And obviously, and actually, this one here, an analyst will like the fact that they spend not 90% in the triage queue, but 30%. That's actually a stat directly from our Palo Alto SOC. So when Palo Alto Networks acquired Domisto, one of the first things they did was deploy Domisto, um, and they've gone from, yeah, 90% of their time doing tier one work to 30%. Again, freeing up their time to do what I call the fun stuff, okay? Like vulnerability research and proactive threat hunting, okay? I think we're nearly done. Okay. Okay, again, being the fact that I've got the privilege of being vendor side but also end user side, um, anyone that says, oh, it's plug and play, yeah, just give them that look and just to see how long they can uh, hold that look. But, uh, but ultimately, you know, a saw tool will have playbooks out of the box and a good saw tool should have all the integrations done for you. So if you work with ServiceNow, someone was talking to me earlier, they said, oh yeah, I've got Splunk, I've got ServiceNow, I've got Tanium. Um, and do we integrate with that? Yes. So a good saw tool should already have done the integration work, the REST API integrations, and they should already have generic playbooks available for you to use. And then what you, but what you still need to do though is interchange those, those playbooks to work with your workflow, okay? So you do need to customize these, okay? Um, what's another key point? Again, I'll send these slides. Um, yeah, and you need to continuously improve them. You're never gonna build a playbook and go, that's it, I'm done. You're always buying new tools, you always wanna change and, and improve and evolve that workflow. So it, it is definitely not plug and play, okay? So bear that in mind. Uh, and finally, I've had already had a good couple of conversations about this. You need to understand what you do today before you can even look at the saw tool. Because when you build a playbook, and I sat down with you and said, right, what takes most of your time from a SOC analyst perspective? If they can't answer that, we can't build those simple playbooks to save that time. Okay? So you really need to have a good idea of your processes today. Have you mapped them out on a document or a pizza packet or whatever? Uh, there was a conversation on Monday where they said, oh yeah, we've got all the playbooks, but it's in this guy's head. I'm thinking, well, you might want to map that down first before he has an accident. Um, but, you know, I think it's a really good practice to define your current workflows. You can then identify the bottlenecks, and then you can digitize those workflows in the saw tool, and then slowly replace those manual tasks with automation tasks. So with that, I believe I'm done. There's a couple of other slides, but I thought I'd save you. I think you've had enough, enough time with me. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for listening, and uh, I open it up to any questions.